Um, this is another talk that I had originally intended to be a boff, but when I found out it had been scheduled for the end of the week instead of the beginning of the week, and it was in a 300-person room, I started thinking about it more like a talk. And so we'll see how this goes, but what I have are enough slides to maybe um, consume about half of the time, and then hopefully there'll be plenty of time for us to have some discussion. And uh, just this morning, I figured out how to use the uh, wiki.debian.net stuff to create a wiki page uh, for us to continue uh, collecting thoughts about the things that I want to talk about today. Um, so first of all, out of curiosity, how many of you have never heard me talk before? Wow! That's cool. Um, I'm really sorry, actually, that more... Uh, people didn't have a chance to be here last Saturday for the Debian Day because uh, while I don't know that that day worked out quite exactly the way uh, we had all thought or expected it might, uh, there's some interesting things talked about there and, and I went and pulled one or two slides out of my slide deck from there to include here today as well. So this has got a little more stuff thrown into it than I had originally intended. Uh, but first of all, who am I? <clears throat> if there are that many of you who haven't heard me talk before, it's probably worth my spending just a second on this. Um, I like to tell people that I made my first contribution to what we now think of as the free and open source software communities in about 1979. This is a piece of assembly language that I wrote when I was in uh, high school for an interesting little microprocessor board you've never heard of. Um, but it got published in a newsletter in Canada, and I got invited to go give a talk at a meeting in Canada, and my parents said, no, you're not going to Canada to give a talk. Um, got my first Unix login when I was at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in the early 80s. Um, that was the year of <clears throat> early BSD stuff on the VAC systems. Uh, CMU was sort of interesting. If you started a project and got some funding, you'd buy VAX and run Berkeley on it, so there were them around the campus. Um, it's sort of a long process, and those of you who did hear me give my talk at DebConf 2 in Toronto, um, or who have gone out and looked at the slides from that, will know that the satellite project that caused me to uh, switch over from being a Berkeley Unix kind of guy and discover Linux and the Debian project in 1994, or early 1995. Um, I've done a lot of different things in Debian over the years and I have not been completely consistent about the amount of energy that I've put in Debian over that time period because, in fact, I went off and spent a couple of years building, uh, helping to build a, a large amateur satellite in the middle of all that time and um, became a, a darn near MIA maintainer for a while. Um, but I've stayed very interested in <clears throat> lots of the things that people sort of take for granted about Debian today or things that I've either had some influence on or are the downstream derivatives of work I did at one point or another in the history of the project. I've been working for the Hewlett Packard Company or its spin-off Agilent Technology since 1986. Um, up until 2001, all of that work was being done in the old part of HP, the test and measurement business. And I didn't actually know much about the internals of or work for the computer part of the company until I was recruited in May of 2001 to go back from Agilent to HP and work on Linux and open source software full time. And after a couple of years of doing engineering work in a lab that's now part of HP's open source and Linux organization, I was invited to join Martin Fink's staff. He's the vice president in HP who's responsible for all of HP's Linux and open source activities around the world uh, to serve as his chief technology officer. And that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So what's this talk all about? Um, it's been my observation that it's really easy to complain about things that you don't like. Um, but my personal impression is that it's much more rewarding instead of complaining about things to ponder ways of making them better and then to set about doing whatever it takes to make them happen. <clears throat> and to me, that's really sort of what the Debian project has been all about since the beginning. This project began because Ian Murdoch um, saw some things that he thought could be improved, and he pondered the best ways to do those and set about trying to make them happen. And our project's been about that ever since. Um, one of the things about being involved in a project like Debian at the sort of level of involvement that I think I have had for you know more than 10 years is that I've had a lot of time to ponder um, what's going on in this project and to think about some of the 
the bigger issues. It's also interesting that um, when you choose to do things like run for the position of Debian project leader and you're as introspective a person as I am, um, it's hard not to spend a lot of time thinking about what is it that makes me excited about this? Why is it that I like being part of this project? Uh, what makes it work for me? What do I think the problems are? What would I do differently if I had the power to make things work differently? And so what I want to offer to you today are just a few of my musings, things that I've been thinking about, um, some of which I've been thinking about for a very long time, but which got their first sort of public airing outside of small conversations at the Debian mini-conference that was held in April this year in Canberra, Australia, just before LinuxConf Australia. And how I ended up presenting them there is kind of a funny story. Um, I was traveling with my family uh, as tourists in Australia for the week or so before LCA, and that happened to be the time that our DPL election ended this year. And Brandon found himself in the <coughs> interesting position he now holds, which uh, is an amazing sort of thing to, to find yourself all of a sudden responsible for. Um, and so when I arrived in Canberra, they said, oh, by the way, um, Brennan is the new DPL, which I had sort of heard, but I hadn't really had a chance to think about very much. And he said, uh, you're part of this Project SCUD thing, right? So you wouldn't mind giving the opening talk at the conference and telling us what that's all about, right? And um, anyway, it was sort of interesting. Uh, so very quickly, I threw some thoughts together. And uh, I didn't see any point in opening an event without being provocative and thought-provoking. I really, really, really didn't intend to sort of do, um, Brandon got elected, here's what Brandon thinks, and here's why, you know, I think we might totally change the structure of the project and do something different. Um, but that's kind of how it came out. Um, what I'd really like for you to do is think of some of the things that I want to talk about today as serious food for thought. Things that we all ought to contemplate, that we ought to use as we think about what's working and not working well in the project today. Um, this is not some perfect answer. Um, and I certainly would hope that we would all work together in the spirit that this project has always uh, used when things were going well to craft a future for ourselves. So there have been a couple things that I've picked up on this week that I sort of want to throw in here <coughs> before I get too far into this because they're all sort of part of the context of what I've been thinking about. And I have to thank a couple of folks for helping me um, with good articulations of this. I think the talk that was given the other day about the history and, and, and status of our new maintainer process um, got me thinking once again this week about this whole idea of community. Um, you know, from a definitional standpoint, um, the dictionary says that a community is a a body of people having common rights, privileges, or interests, or living in the same place under the same laws and regulations. And we all understand this. We participate in traditional communities. Um, they might be the towns we live in or the schools we attended. At least in the United States, it's amazing on fall weekends when football games are happening to see the you know, strong sense of community that people have for the schools that they attended or the ones they hate because they beat them in football at some point or something like that. Uh, there are also you know, churches, sports teams, volunteer organizations. I think everyone has a sort of a personal idea of what a community means. But one of the things I don't think we think about very often is that um, the internet enabled this formation of a whole new class of communities that didn't really exist very much before, with some interesting and notable exceptions. And that's communities where there are lots of people with common interests or values, but who might be really broadly geographically distributed. Nat Friedman um, used an example in a talk that he gave publicly recently that <clears throat> I had to chuckle over because it made it clear that he and I have been reading the same books lately. If you haven't read it, the book, The Professor and the Madman, which is a description of how the Oxford English Dictionary got started and um, an expose on some of the more interesting characters involved in, in helping that to happen, uh, has some interesting information about what was perhaps the first of this class of project where lots of people with a common interest who were really geographically distributed figured out how to do something really great together. But I don't want a rat hole talking about that, even though it's cool. Um, when we bring this idea of community into um, the free and open source software development world, we think about it mostly in terms of this community development model. <clears throat> and it is a key attribute of Linux and many open source applications that they're developed and supported by the community. 
And what does that mean? Well, fundamentally, it means that there's no one company that's in charge of things, and there are a range of contributors with different interests and abilities and motivations who come together to make this great work happen. And the reason this is so cool is that it allows this whole freedom of choice thing to, to, to work effectively. I pulled this out of a slide deck that I use all the time when I'm talking to HP customers to try and explain how it is that we in HP try to interact with the software development community around Linux and open source <coughs> and why it is that we behave the way we do. You know, we, we think of this as all as being hugely disruptive, and when I say disruptive, I mean that there's not a single business that I'm aware of inside HP that doesn't have the word Linux somewhere in their business plans for the next year. It's become pervasive. Everybody has to care about it. It doesn't matter whether it's the printer guys trying to figure out what to do about device drivers or the notebook guys trying to figure out how to you know, make some Linux support available for their systems or the server guys trying to figure out how Wall Street can be happy running you know, huge uh, processes and databases on open source platforms. It's all over the place. <coughs> we ship a couple hundred products today that have Linux embedded in them that people don't even know about because they're consumer products or other appliance things and it's just an embedded part of the product. It's all over the place. And so to do this, we try to participate as part of the community, consistent with the community's values, uh, to develop you know, enterprise capabilities and other things that are of value to HP. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this whole idea of community and when the talk about uh, the new maintainer process came up the other day, one of the ideas that sort of popped into my head in the middle of all of that from the things that they said that I think is worth highlighting is this notion that we could think of the NM process as a citizenship process rather than as a filter. I know that at least for in my own thinking in the past, um, this whole idea of um, what NM was supposed to be about was a mixture of an attempt at socialization. Now, how do you formalize the mechanisms of making sure that the people who are going to participate have actually read the foundation documents that we all sort of agree are our expression of our shared set of values in the project? But they've also grown to, to behave like a filter, hazing process, uh, you know, whatever your favorite definition is. <coughs> um, you know, in effect, we've, we've made it hard so that only people who really care will try to fight their way through it in some sense. Um, I wonder sometimes if it's really more important to test for the kind of depth we seem sometimes to test for in a single area, whether we should be more focused on ensuring that new members of our community have a broad foundation of knowledge across all of the areas of work in Debian. Um, when I think about what citizenship means in real world communities and, and countries and so forth, there's an expectation actually that <coughs> uh, people who apply for citizenship will be willing to learn as much or more about foundational things like how the judicial system works and you know how uh, representatives get elected and all of those sorts of things than most of us who you know were born in that country will remember from our primary school educations and <clears throat> this is all about a breadth thing making sure that you have enough context to be able to appreciate all of the other things that are going on in this community so that you can behave as a good citizen of the community and you understand what that means and this causes me to think about something that this morning I sort of, in my head, wrote down is gating versus rating. Um, what I mean by this is, is gating is sort of the process of do you open the gate for this person or not? It's the filter. It's do you decide to let someone in or keep them out? Rating, on the other hand, is you know, how do you discover who's actually behaving well, what's working, what's not working? Is there some way that we can sort of measure the behavior and performance of people as citizens of our community and use that as some kind of, a, you know, in, in the end, some kind of a gating function on their access to things? And <clears throat> um, I know that in conversations we've had at various times that Brandon has expressed concern about this notion of having multiple tiers of developers and, in effect, building sort of different levels of citizenship in our community. But I keep scratching my head about what the right approach to it is. We currently have a model that you know, sort of goes deep and narrow, and I keep wondering if there isn't some way we can go you know, more broad and end up with something that would actually work better for us in the future. Brandon. Why don't you speak and I'll repeat? It's faster.
tell I'm going to run. Beat Be- Be- can tell I'm going to run long. I was having a conversation with Hannah Wallach the other day, and I, I just floated an idea, idea to her. I can't speak. Uh, I can't speak for her and say what she thinks of it, but um, in the wake of her presentation on NM, it occurred to me that um, it, the current NM process is designed uh, to try to prevent people from ever screwing up, really. So we test them on all kinds of things and to, uh, give them all kinds of, of, of questions to, designed to serve mostly as preventative measures, ensure that they have clues. And the thing that occurred to me was, well, wouldn't it be interesting, and I think there's already some stuff on Alioth that kind of begins to point this direction, wouldn't it be interesting if we could just screen people to the level uh, that we want to determine citizenship, the gating part, and then let people rate themselves regarding their various... I'm surrounded by German. What's going on here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're coming through the PA, no. Um, at any rate, um, if, if we gated people enough to let them in, uh, to, to let them vote in our elections, maybe we could let them rate themselves regarding their t- things like their technical expertise, like do they want a Debian.org email address is, is one important criterion. Some developers don't, and the fact that some people have those addresses has actually caused problems when those addresses are used in certain contexts, as we well know. Uh, at least those of us who've read any of the lists for the past year. Um, another important issue is, is, is package uploading. Some people don't want, necessarily want that privilege, and some people shouldn't have it. And if we had just a few areas like this, I imagine we should, you know, again, use the Enrico principle um, of just having a, a, a relatively few, then what do you gain out of this? Well, you get, you get not only the ability to switch off access to various things on a voluntary basis, but when someone says they do want this responsibility, they're making an affirmative statement. I want this power. I think I can handle it. So if they do mess it up, you can come to them, uh, you know, with a little bit more of a disciplinary thing, and they can't. They can't. Basically, they can't claim ignorance because they affirmatively stated that this is a responsibility they thought they could handle. Yes, I'm, I'm not stupid. Okay, because what you what you said there is uh, changes in in import and citizenship process. I think that was all the things that were happening. When other members, when I did uh, go to my NM, that was just a one and a half year ago. A lot of things were about just well, uh, what what do you know? And a lot of things have now been changed to. Uh, please behave as a good citizen. Like, okay. please show me how would a sponsored an, uh, upload from a uh, look like if you do it for us and thi- similar things. So I think we are already on the right track there. But of course, there are some more steps to do. Yeah, and of course, is this working now? Yeah. 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 Dudes, thanks. Um, batteries. <coughs> batteries. It's always batteries. Yeah, my little travel alarm has the same problem. It seems to work fine until the battery runs out, and then I miss flights. Um, <laughs> actually, I've never missed a flight, but I've I've not miss some because they were multiple hours late. Um, in any case, um, now that I've said that, I'm in trouble. Um, <clears throat> and again, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is to give people things to think about. These are some things that I've heard this week, particularly this notion of thinking about this as a citizenship process, which is sort of the next step down the conceptual chain from a socialization process, which I always thought was part of what we were trying to accomplish, at least with the mentoring and and sponsorship pieces of all of uh, these things that go on with new maintainers. But um, obviously, there are lots of people who have lots of thoughts, um, and this is something we ought to follow up on. So another idea that um, is the one that actually um, got all the attention uh, down in Australia in April was that I keep wondering if the model of governance or how we structure and operate the project that's currently coded in the Debian Constitution still represents the best set of choices for a project today. And when you think about this, um, out of curiosity, how many of you have read the Debian Constitution like in the last six months? Wow, really? Are you all in the NMQ or something? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't expect there to be that many hands. Um, So how many of you actually remember what it says about the responsibilities and the rights and, you know, powers of the DPL and the technical committee? 
Yeah, it gets a little fuzzy, doesn't it? Well, what I think is interesting is there's this whole set of sort of misimpressions that are floating around out there that somehow um, <clears throat> the Constitution says one thing, and, and I keep trying to quote it to people from time to time and, and get strange reactions. But one of the questions we could reasonably ask is, are the DPL and the Technical Committee taking full advantage of the powers that are part of the current definitions of their roles in the Constitution? And regardless of what you think the answer is, is that good or bad? And another thing you could ask is, have the conditions in which our project is operating changed enough since the time that this was written in 98 originally uh, to warrant a different approach? Um, and some of the reasons I get to asking these questions are that it's been my observation that the whole process of electing a DPL is a strange event for Debian. What do I mean by that? Well, in Debian, we really value working together, but the whole process of electing an individual is rewarding people who are willing to compete with each other for an ill-defined, well, maybe not ill-defined, but certainly ill-defined in practice role in our project. There's also this notion that, you know, as Debian keeps getting bigger and bigger, I think Brandon's expressed a couple times this week that he has great concern that, you know, maybe it's just too complex for one person to directly wrap their brain around. And that's what's led us to some interesting experiments and, in, in, you know, sort of tiered delegation, which <coughs> uh, is sort of what the SCUD thing's about. Um, there are limits, there are constraints on the role of the DPL um, that are defined by our Constitution, all of which were well intended. Maybe not all of which have really out worked out well in practice. Uh, it's unclear to me. And one of the things that just drives me crazy, though I completely understand why we coded it that way at the time, is that the process of electing DPL takes nine weeks every year. Now, should it really consume nine weeks of our lives? <coughs> well, it probably really doesn't. We don't all just sort of stop doing everything else during this process. But for anybody who's contemplating participating in the process, you really have to think, and, and I speak as someone who's like been through it three times with a you know, 330 batting average, um, <coughs> 333 I get well. Um, having, having been through this, you really sort of have to contemplate putting lots of other things in your life at a lower priority level for you know, more than two months so that you can be you know, visible, participatory, and responsive as questions come up and, and people want to know what you think about this and everybody wants to tell you what they think so that you'll factor that into your thought processes and so forth. I guess in theory, you know, it should only be that intense during the quote-unquote campaigning period, which is the middle three weeks, but my experience is it doesn't really quite work that way. So overall, this whole electing a single individual thing just seems strange to me. Um, and it's, I have this sense that our technical committee, as it's currently defined, and, or, or perhaps uh, better stated as it's currently behaving, just isn't very satisfying. Um, there's this perception that the technical committee is inactive, and that because it's inactive and doesn't do anything, that there's no reason to try and use it. And of course, that's a vicious circle, because if you don't try to invoke the technical committee to get help with things, then they're not active, and there's, well, you see what I'm saying. It's very clear that the composition of the committee needs a periodic review and refresh. <coughs> um, there is a sort of committee private mailing list, and one of the things that I'll let leak at sort of the conceptual level is that there is a discussion ongoing right now about the possibility of adding some new uh, people to the committee, and a little bit of discussion about what you do about you know, what the process ought to be for getting folks that have really gone inactive and just sort of aren't around anymore to, to sort of de-participate from the committee. Um, and then there's this interesting phenomena where many people seem to wish the committee would take a more active role in defining Debian's technical direction. And I think this comes from the fact that there are all of these other projects around us that have technical advisory boards or when I look at how the GNOME and Apache foundations work. There really are, in some sense, groups of people who um, are uh, put in a place for one reason or another where they have the ability to review different thoughts about the direction that the project might follow. And they build that sort of sense of technical vision for the next period of time that, that everybody then goes and tries to make their contributions fit in with. I think the Debian project sort of has an interesting history of, of floating in and out of you know, having a vision and having that vision actually be sort of useful and relevant uh, as, a, as a guiding force for what we do. 
Um, on one level, it's gratifying to me that this notion of Debian as a, a universe of packages from which we would draw interesting subsets to do different useful things. Um, the fact that that's still around is gratifying since I spent a lot of time trying to, you know, cleanly articulate that um, a few years ago. But the fact that somehow that hasn't, it's, it's, you know, we're struggling right now with how that ought to evolve and what we ought to be thinking are our directions next. Um, and people seem to wonder, you know, if there isn't somebody that ought to be sort of helping to focus that uh, energy and they look at the technical committee's definition and if you look in the Constitution it certainly says that this is something the technical committee could do but the current composition of the committee and the way it actually behaves kind of makes that not happen somehow. Um, there's another thing that I spent a lot of time thinking about. I'm, I'm also on the board of SPI which is the umbrella organization that provides a legal and financial existence for the Debian project and as you know, everybody here I hope is aware, <coughs> uh, SPI's kind of had a rough history. There have been things that really didn't work well for a while. And uh, at DebConf 3 in Oslo a couple of years ago, there was a session that I guess Mako sort of organized and various people participated in uh, talking about SPI and some of the problems it was facing at the time. And I, you know, injected somewhere in that process some questions about whether it might make sense for us to look at something more like the foundation model that GNOME and Apache and so forth we're using as a way to either fix SPI or to build a, a, relation, a replacement for it that would actually work better for Debian. I came to realize after a while that that was fixing the wrong problem, that SPI had issues and they needed to be resolved, but that SPI doesn't have the same relationship with Debian that something like the GNOME Foundation has with GNOME or the Apache Foundation has with Apache. SPI exists to provide a set of services to projects like Debian and the other member projects, but it doesn't exist to provide, you know, a sense of vision or direction to those projects. In fact, quite the contrary, I'd, I think the member projects of SPI would be pretty disturbed if this SPI thing from up in the vaporous beyond all of a sudden came down and started trying to assert some sense of direction or control over their behavior. And the good news is since that time, I think SPI has, for the most part, fixed itself. Um, I certainly am reasonably satisfied with the way things have been going. There's a lot more work to be done, and I would certainly encourage more Debian developers to pay attention and get involved. But I still think there's some ideas that we might take from that process, though, like the notion of elected boards. So then there's this Project SCUD thing, <coughs> and you've heard about this in different directions from different folks. Um, it first sort of came towards me from um, uh, Andreas, who was per contemplating the possibility of running for DPL in this past election, and was very interested in this whole notion of small teams and their effects and how they might improve the project, and approached me about participating in this DC DPL team concept. And to be honest, I had to spend some time thinking about it. Um, I didn't immediately say, oh yes, it's a brilliant idea, I'd love to participate. But the more I thought about it, um, the more I started to think that this was an experiment that was being proposed that would attempt to address some of the things I'd been concerned about. Um, and when I thought about it, I realized that in my own history in Debian, that I had provided some kind of counsel or advice or you know, had some kind of a, a, a stronger than average working relationship with every DPL going back to, to Ian Murdoch and certainly including uh, Bruce and everyone who's come since. And so there really wasn't anything unnatural or inappropriate about my agreeing to you know, be part of a board of counsel or advice for a DPL. And then when Brandon became involved in the team and we ended up with the composition of people that we have today, <coughs> um, you know, it, it really seemed like we were getting a reasonable mix of representation of different viewpoints and different concerns in the project. And I was fairly excited about it by the time the election happened. I had actually intended during the DPL comment period, uh, during the DPL campaigning period in the middle to post my thoughts about all of this and why I had agreed to participate in it. Unfortunately, there was a very serious medical issue that cropped up in my family involving my father during that interval, and I just disappeared for about three weeks to go try and do the right thing with the family. And then once the campaigning period was over, I didn't think it was appropriate to you know, go spouting off too much until after the election was over. But some of the concerns that were raised about this whole approach are that the relationship between the DPL 
and this DPL team really isn't very clear. It's not something that exists in our Constitution. The team was mostly self-selected, and at least one group of Debian project participants were vocal in different ways about feeling excluded. And that just made the whole thing be not as sweet as it might have been. And at the end of the day, <coughs> it's an experiment. I hope it turns out to be a successful experiment, but it's a hack. And I really think we could do a better job. So this sort of led me eventually to wondering if all of these things, in my mind at least, weren't leading towards the notion that it was time to think about something as drastic as amending Debian's constitution. And when I say drastic, it's because those of you who know me know that the whole GR process, you know, frankly, kind of scares the pants off me. Um, I was <clears throat> not very encouraging to people who proposed GRs during the time that I was DPL because I almost always thought there was some better way to solve the problem. And in fact, I think most of the problems that we faced in that time were faced better and more effectively and with less angst and strife in the project by other means. But frankly, there's no way to do anything about the contents of the Constitution without um, an election or vote involving all of the registered developers in the project. So I have gradually kind of, you know, built myself up to the notion that, you know, maybe I could tolerate doing this. Um, and the idea that I have, which is really the idea I wanted to inject here to get everybody thinking about and discussing and contemplating the pros and cons of so that we could have a productive conversation about whether it's something we want to pursue and if so, how, is this notion that we could change the structure of governance in the Debian project to do away with the role of the DPL and the technical committee and replace both of them with what amounts to an elected leadership board. The idea that I had with this is that the roles that are currently played and sort of the powers that are currently assigned to the DPL and the technical committee would in this model um, be things that were appointed or delegated directly by that board. Um, it's my experience that most successful nonprofit organizations in the U.S. that I've been involved in sort of operate this way. They have a board of directors and then the board votes amongst themselves to determine who the officers of the corporation will be and and sometimes they go beyond the set of elected people if there's someone who's a really ideal person to be a treasurer or something like that. Um, one of the things that this could do is it could cause the candidates that run for these positions to be motivated to campaign on how well they can work in a team kind of an environment instead of having them focus on individual differentiation, which is the thing that I think is so strange about our current DPL election process. Maybe that's something that we could figure out how to change without having to go through this kind of a structural thing, but um, it's certainly one of the things that's led me to thinking this way. Um, I personally think that more qualified people might be likely to run for a position on a board like this than would be willing to run for an individual post. Um, it's certainly true for me, myself, personally, that the idea of running for DPL again is frankly not very attractive. Uh, not only do I have like a 330 batting average, which I realize Brandon doesn't think is a big deal, <coughs> uh, since, <laughs> since I think he's proved that that's not a, long, uh, a permanent impediment to success, um, but uh, frankly, the whole sort of process and the, the sense of responsibility, you know, unique personal responsibility that comes out of it and so forth are not things that I particularly relish at this time. Uh, however, you know, I might be willing to run for a board slot. And in talking to other folks, there are a number of people who would love to have a more, you know, significant role in all of the things that are going on in this kind of a way but aren't particularly interested in running to be DPL. And I think that it might be easier for such an elected board, if they believed it really was part of their mandate, to take a more proactive role in defining and articulating our vision for the project, in particular technology vision for the project, than it is for the current technical committee. But again, that's something we could also choose to address by reinvigorating our current technical committee or making it abundantly clear to them that it's something that we'd like them to work on. So at this point, um, you've heard the things I've been thinking about and musing about and scratching my head about. I'm not proposing these as, you know, the ultimate solution to life, the universe, and everything. And I'm certainly not trying to suggest that I'm <coughs> disappointed with or frustrated with Brandon or any of those other misinterpretations that popped out of the, the session in Australia. But these are all the things I've been thinking about. I'll point out that all of my talks, including this slide set, eventually show up on my website, and this one's actually there right now. 
Um, and this morning I went and figured out wiki.debian.net and created a governance page so that we'll have a place to collect thoughts and ideas about how to evolve our project's governance as we go forward. So that, questions? Yeah, Andy. <coughs> so, uh, thank you very much, Spiedel. I think you, as that's one of the most major concerns that a lot of people have about the team's cut, so that includes myself. Uh, when I first did about the team's cut, it was just coming like something, well, it just was there. I, I can well the mail <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peter, I can well imagine well, the member sitting, sitting in Lyons uh, uh, flat in Vancouver, uh, having Elmo next to him, uh, who said, well, what's that? That's just come about, up, uh, up, and we noticed that two people who are in Team's Cut invite us to go to Vancouver, and we didn't know about it. So that's not really one of the most major issues why I voted personally against the pe people in the, in the Team's Cut. But of course, I think that the t a team idea was a very good idea. So I was, well, really, I said... Conflicted. Yeah, the team was good, yeah. but not that team, please. And yeah. Frankly speaking, that was the cause. Yeah, here, here's the target. Well, well, <coughs> actually, well uh, and, and I really think we should go that way because we, we need a team. I think it is too much for a single person to go on. And so what, and actually, what, are, what are your thoughts about how we should... Uh, well, perhaps such something about the technical committee. Why I, don't, why I think they can't take a more active role because the current ways they are constructed, they just, well, they just add themselves. So it's a bit difficult because they don't have a really a clear mandate. Whereas if somebody says, okay, I have a good idea, and we vote them into the DPL t uh, team or the board, then it's very clear that the developers have a proof to go on in that way. So I think that's a, but you need some elected board to really be an advisory board in the stronger sense that, uh, for, for example, the KDA Foundation has. Okay. So. Yeah, Brandon, then Ian. Um, one of the concerns that we've seen crop up periodically over the years is, you know, um, to, to, to take a kind of a strong position here, you know, we can refactor the, the project leadership as much as we like, um, but it's not going to do a lot of good if not everybody feels like they are part of the uh, governed. Mm -hmm. um, and there are uh, areas in the Debian project that are vested with authority that predate the Constitution. And um, I've spoken with, with some of these people and they've made postings over the years um, and they're not comfortable exactly with, with the idea of, uh, say, a, the possibility of a madman DPL, for example. And I'm not sure that, uh, oh, have we already had that? But no, <laughs> but, uh, no, no, never. No, of course not. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure that, the, that these same historical roles would be any more comfortable with a different thing. I mean, it, it's kind of the idea of so. So there are a know, couple of fundamental. Well, we've been we've been doing this for ten years now. You know, you can change the constitution. You know, you can change. You can put a board in there. You can put a person in there. Do what you want, man. But you know, this work's still got to be done. And there's no benefit to them in in recognizing. So there are a couple of fundamental things that that come to mind when we start talking about this. One is that I think organizational structure. You know, good organizational structure very rarely does anything to sort of guarantee success. Right. But if you get the wrong structure, it really can impede progress and success. That's sort of one idea. And the other one is that <clears throat> it's been my observation that every time I personally have ended up in a situation where I started to think I was indispensable, and believe me, it's happened at various times in my history, um, when something finally sort of forced me to realize that that wasn't true, um, things in general sort of picked up pace and moved better as a result. And so there is this sort of trade-off, I think, between um, motivating participation and you know, how you actually sort of you know, keep from getting stuck in a rut or something. Right. So you know, I don't know that I have any more brilliant thoughts than that. I know, Ian, do you have something else? Or yeah, should we? I, I, just had a, I just had a brief anecdote, and then I'll hand over to Ian. Um, actually, I, I did an interview with a French sociologist yesterday, and I shared with him an anecdote that I've shared on other occasions, which is one of the reasons I got as, as involved in Debian as I did, which was you know, adopting the X486 packages shortly after joining, was because I... Huh? Oh. She's picking uh, on you. Okay. Um, was because Bruce was making his final resignation. At that point, I didn't have... Which one? Yeah, I know. <laughs> the, fi the final, final resignation. Oh, right. Yeah. The one with the famous message to private, I believe. Um, but uh, you know, at that time, I didn't know about his previous ones, and I very much identified Debbie and the project with the identity of Bruce Perrin's the leader, in part because he was such a, 
a, yeah. a big figure. He's but you know, that was an easy thing to perceive in, in early 1998 when somebody didn't have access to the Dash private archives or had got it but didn't have time to go read them all. Nowadays, it would be an even bigger hurdle. Um, so now that wasn't true, and I learned that you know Debian wasn't going to crumble just because Bruce walked away, uh, and that motivated me to do a good thing. I, th I think um, there have been differences of opinion over how I maintain X eighty six over the years, but uh, but at least for the most part, I think it, it it caused me to get more involved, to care more about Debian, and uh, and that's what got me started down this road. So that uh, that sense of indispensability uh, kind of cuts both ways. So. I, I'm, I think I broadly disagree with you. Um, there's one, the, 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 the big thrust of, I mean, you, there's two sort of things you seem to be saying. One is that you're sort of unhappy with the way the DPL exists and is elected and so forth. And possibly there's some argument for now that the project is much larger, having more people there, more positions elected. But, I very strongly disagree with your second point, um, as I see it, about particularly about technical vision or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, the I wrote the constitution as I did specifically to avoid a situation of overt leadership, where the leaders have power beyond influence. That is, where they're able to make decisions and somehow tell people what to work on and 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 block things that they don't like um, and the this is why the technical committee is limited to answering questions that people ask of it or maybe issuing an opinion or two um, and this is why the DPL's power is actually limited as it is um, and I think that all of those reasons still apply and I think it's a mistake for Debian to have some board that tells everybody what the next vision is. I think it'd be fine for the DPL to do that or some new DPL team to do that, that's not a problem. But to give them the kind of formal power to tell people what to work on or to, to officially set the direction, that's wrong. What we should be doing is we should be letting people work on what they think is important. And that's why people get involved with Debian, to do what they think is important and it's their vision that counts. And if you can inspire them, well and good, but you shouldn't need to tell them what to do. So it sounds to me like the, the, the only piece of this that you might want redacted is the notion that somehow the technical committee ought to be part of what gets changed replaced, right? So that you would in effect retain a separation between the sort of leadership visionary component of what's happening and the ultimate authority for you know, technical problem resolution. Uh, yes, absolutely. In particular, I'm strongly opposed to the idea that people with the power to kind of tell people what to do in a technical sense and say specifically you must do it like this or like that, those people should not be directly elected. Okay, all right. I understand that. Yeah, all right. So that, yeah, and in fact, that makes reasonable sense to me, and we need to, that's why these are, in my case, thoughts. So who's next? Franz. Yeah, there he is. Okay. Um, do, you have, do you have any ideas of the composition of the board? Um, should certain areas of the project be represented in it? Uh, like maybe somebody from the release team, maybe somebody from FTP Masters. Um, what I think skills it's a should be present in, in a board? So for those who missed the first couple words before the audio on that mic came up, the question is, what do I think about the composition of this board? Should specific groups in the project be represented? I'm actually not in favor of that because I really have this strong sense that you know leadership is sort of a, a, a people thing, not a positional thing. The concern that was expressed about the SCUD team and the fact that it maybe wasn't adequately representative of the developers, I think was mostly tied to the fact that the team was you know, somewhat self-selecting or at least sort of guided self-selection based on who the 
initiators of the idea thought they wanted to invite to participate. And the fact that there was sort of no ability for anyone outside of that team to either sort of volunteer to participate, though we have since added at least one person, Mako, beyond the original composition of the team. Um, so no, my thought is that I don't want a specific sort of, we need a release master, and we need one of these, and we need one of those. I guess my hope is that we would naturally end up with at least some of the more important areas of the project being represented because it's been my observation, I think very much in alignment with you know Ian's thoughts on this, that the people that care the most tend to be the ones who are involved the most and you know who would want to have some say and input in this process. But I suppose it could always work out horribly poorly, but my general sense is that I wouldn't want it to be specifically composed of representatives from different groups. Yeah, the Condorcet method is is really, I mean, that's one of the brilliant pieces of our Constitution, thank you very much, Ian, is the way we actually do the election part and how it allows the, the sort of, you know, varying relationships between people's opinions to all get adequately counted. Andreas. Yeah, I wanted to um, reply to Ian, who seems to, uh, yeah, well, first of all, he, uh, it seems to miss that we have a leadership problem, general leadership problem in Debian, and that that we that is one of our key problems that we hardly have any leadership at all, um, and those who do lead in the project partly do that, do that without really knowing and reflecting upon it, but still do it. We have examples of leadership that does work, but the leadership that for example, the Debian project leader has hardly any power to lead <coughs> at all. So even though you succeeded in forming the, uh, the constitution that f in that way, we now ended up with the other opposite that we can't really have a leader in that sense. Then, um, so I think that, that in that ca kind, in, in this way you polarized uh, the thing. It's, not, it's a gradual thing that we need more leadership. We don't want a dictator, but we want more leadership than we have now. And then um, about the work workload of the DPL, I think you um, underestimated that e extremely. I've been following TBM when he tried to keep up with stuff. And it's, <laughs> he, has, he was really busy. Well, I think Brandon is also busy and he, um, it's it's a good thing that well, he has to be fair. I think I think we have to remind ourselves that the DPL's powers in the Constitution do include a very broad power of delegation that you know all of us who've served in the role could have been more effective about using. The evidence that none of us really have been all that effective in using it is part of what gets me scratching my head about whether there isn't you know some different way to get a force multiplier at that level. I gather we're running out of time. Okay, so Brandon. There's a BOF, a DPL team BOF or something scheduled this evening. When is it? A Q&A session with, with various leadership figures. A so Q&A session with various leadership figures or so at yeah. 1900? Uh, that's right, 1900 Up at Smecky? Joel Hart organized that. So, uh, it's, yeah, I guess it's in the aquarium. Okay, in the aquarium up at the Hack Lab at 7 p.m. tonight. And um, I'm sure that I'll be there and some of the other folks are. So if you want to continue the conversation, show up there. Let's talk about this on Debian-Project, which seems like the obvious mailing list. And uh, as I said, I've created a wiki. Yep. Thank you very much.